Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, What's on Your Plate? Healthy Eating 101, sponsored by TELUS Atlantic Canada Community Board. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have joined the presentation listening using your computer system by default. If you prefer to join over the telephone, just select the arrow next to the mute unmute icon on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Select leave computer audio and then select phone call and follow the prompt to dial in. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording. The theme of today's webinar is What's on Your Plate? Healthy Eating 101. Ask Atlantic Canadians if you would like to make positive nutritional choices for themselves and their families, and most would say yes. However, in an environment of fad diets, confusing and seemingly contradictory health claims and food labels, and ingredient lists that are a blur of chemicals, many of us find the concept of making healthy food choices daunting. The Kidney Foundation of Canada, partnering with the TELUS Atlantic Community Board, is hosting a series of free public nutrition sessions. The highlights, recipes and resources to take home, nutrition advice for those with diabetes and high blood pressure, healthy tips for every family member by learning to make small dietary changes, read labels, and modify recipes and more. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Heidi Murphy. Heidi Murphy is a registered dietitian who graduated from Mount St. Vincent University with a Bachelor of Science in Applied Human Nutrition. And now Heidi, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining What's on Your Plate, Healthy Eating 101. I'm speaking to you right now from St. John's, Newfoundland, um, and we will go right into the question. We're short on time and have lots to cover. I'm gonna turn off my camera just so we can focus right in on the content. So what are some of the health culprits that are related to chronic kidney disease um, or can lead to it? Um, first one being diabetes, uh, sorry, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, um, and stroke, high blood pressure. So like I said, we know that all of these things can lead to kidney disease, but what we'll be covering today are ways that you can manage and control these things um, so that hopefully can prevent um, kidney disease or help manage your kidney disease. So obesity, we know, is a worldwide epidemic. We currently have over 60% of Canadians who are overweight or obese, and it's now uh, considered a chronic disease. Um, it can lead to many things such as metabolic syndrome, which we know is related to heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, and kidney disease. Um, things like kidney stones, uh, fatty liver, depression, um, death and infertility, as well as many other complications. So what are some things that you can do to prevent um, and manage chronic kidney disease? So avoid smoking. Um, we know that smoking has uh, related risks of increasing our blood pressure, um, plaque buildup on the artery walls, um, get adequate sleep, which is sometimes easier said than done, um, manage stress. Um, we know that stress can have a very negative impact on many things from our metabolism. It can increase our appetite or um, make it go away, um, and it's also related to um, to other diseases. Um, exercise, you know, is very important. Um, that doesn't need to be going to a gym or doing anything intensive. Um, it can be just as easy as going for a walk, taking the stairs, gardening, house cleaning. There are many things that we can do for exercise. Uh, managing our blood pressure. Um, managing our cholesterol and triglycerides, and managing our blood sugar, which are all things that I'm going to uh, cover today. So diet, is what you are eating not something you're on? Um, as mentioned in the intro, um, 
there's a lot of misinformation out there right now, lots of different types of diet from the ketogenic to the ideal protein to low carb, high carb, low fat. So it can be very overwhelming and very confusing. Um, so, but in actual fact, like I mentioned, diet is what we're eating. Um, and one diet doesn't fit all. So uh, what your friend or your sister or your partner may be doing um, might not be necessarily right for you. And what right is for, for you is changing an eating pattern that um, is going to be sustainable. So maybe that's making small little changes over a long time that can all end up in big changes. Um, registered dietitians are very helpful. Um, so getting the right information. Um, and like I said, finding what works for you. One size doesn't fit all. And also, um, our diet and our needs change over time um, with our age, our body composition, um, how active we are, and different illnesses. So we know that having chronic kidney disease, um, some of those diet, uh, diet changes um, are very different. Um, as well as there's no quick fixes. Um, so speaking of that, we're gonna cover a little bit more about our macronutrients. Um, so what makes up the food that we eat? Um, and the first one here is protein. Um, so our protein uh, mainly comes from things like meat and fish, chicken, beans, lentils, nuts and seeds, and dairy. Um, and about 20% of your calories should come from your protein. Um, but this may be a little less for individuals with chronic kidney disease or a little higher for people on dialysis. Um, so we know that if you do have chronic kidney disease, a moderate protein intake um, is very much needed. So going back to the previous slide about some of these um, different diets, um, a lot of them are heavily focused on high protein. And for individuals with chronic kidney disease, that's not necessarily the best option um, because we know that um, higher intake of protein is more work on the kidneys as well as then you end up taking in more potassium and phosphorus, um, which, which can make it more difficult um, to manage those things. So certainly talking to um, your dietitian in your clinic that you go to um, if you do have kidney disease about different options. So the next one is carbohydrates. Um, so carbohydrates should make up about 45 to 60 percent of your total calorie intake. There's actually three types of carbohydrates. A lot of people don't realize this. The first one is starch, um, the second one being fiber, and the third one being sugar. So starch is found in most of our um, starchy foods. So things like bread, cereal, pasta, potato, rice, also found in fruits and vegetables, and um, again, beans and lentils. Um, fiber um, is very, very important when we're trying to um, get healthy. Fiber helps us stay full for longer. Um, it can help manage blood sugars and keep our blood sugars stable. Um, it can help with lowering cholesterol. So it does many positive things. Um, and fiber is found in, once again, beans comes up often. Things like bran, fruits, nuts and seeds, vegetables, and our whole grain foods. So whole grain bread, whole grain pasta, um, things like quinoa. And then the last one there is sugar. So there's uh, different types. There's our natural sugars, which are found in things like fruit and dairy. Um, lactose is that natural sugar that's found in the milk and our milk products, um, as well as a little bit in vegetables. But the ones that we tend to be a bit more concerned about are those added sugars that are added to a lot of those yummy foods like baked goods, candies, ice cream, soft drinks. But they're also added to foods that we typically think um, of as healthy foods like cereals, yogurt. Um, and I'll be speaking a little bit more about sugar in the next uh, few slides. But at the end of the day, when we're doing our label reading, we want to focus more on fiber because, as I mentioned, it helps do many positive things, um, and we want to focus less on added sugars. So how much sugar do you think an average Canadian eats per year? About 88 pounds or 40 kilograms, so quite a bit. Um, so if you're wondering um, how we do that measurement, and that when you're looking on a nutrition label, or a nutrition facts table, I should say, Four grams of sugar is equal to one teaspoon. 
Um, so for added sugars, we, uh, for females, we want to try and keep that less than 24 grams or six teaspoons per day. And for males, we want to keep it less than 30, uh, 36 grams or nine teaspoons per day. So you'll see there, um, if you're looking at a nutrition back table, like a cereal, for example, um, in three quarters of a cup, we've got three grams of fiber and seven grams of sugar. So that would be considered a pretty healthy cereal. Um, but so where does most of our added sugar come from? So as you can see, 33% from soft drinks, um, baked goods, fruit drinks, um, and other 25% from other, um, that would be maybe the sugar or honey that you're adding to your coffee or tea, um, you know, that double-double, that two teaspoons of sugar. So that would be two out of your six if you're a female. Um, as well, as, like I said, uh, added sugars also include things like honey and maple syrup, agave, molasses, anything like that. Um, so one can of regular pop, so one can of, say, regular Coke or Pepsi has 39 grams of sugar, so 10 teaspoons of sugar. So with just one can of pop, uh, for a male, you're having your added sugar for the day. Um, so that's certainly an area that we, you know, we can cut back in. So the last of our macronutrients is our fat. Um, so about 25 to 30 percent of our daily calorie intake should come from our fat. And this is an area that we're getting a lot more questions about. Um, you know, for a long time, we had the idea that fat is really bad or not good for us and everything should be low fat and we should eliminate it as much as possible. But we know that fat is actually very important for us. It's a part of a very, um, can be a part of a very healthy diet and that we need fat. It's important for um, lots of things. Um, absorption of certain nutrients, so vitamins A, D, E, and K, we need fat for the absorption of those, um, as well as for hormones and lots of different things, chemical reactions that happen in our body, we need fat for that. Um, but it's focusing on the right types of fat, um, and we want to focus on increasing those unsaturated fats, so those healthy fats, I like to call them, olive oil, canola oil, nuts and seeds, fatty fish, like salmon, mackerel, and herring. And we want to limit saturated and trans fat, which I'm going to talk about. So the first one here is saturated fat. Um, we talk about limiting our saturated fat because it can increase our cholesterol levels. And we know that elevated cholesterol levels um, can lead to, um, you know, lots of different heart conditions and kidney disease. So we certainly want to keep our cholesterol levels um, down. Um, saturated fat is usually solid at room temperature. It's found in things like hard margarine, palm oil, and coconut oil, as well as it's found in our animal products. So um, if you're seeing fat in your steak, um, skin on your chicken, uh, pork, so things like bacon that have all that fat on there, um, butter, and lard. Um, there's a lot of talk around right now about saturated fat and that it's a little bit controversial in the sense that maybe saturated fat isn't as bad as what we once thought. Um, and, but that's more in relation to the vegetarian sources of um, and dairy sources of saturated fat. So things like coconut oil um, and dairy. So things like butter or 2% um, milk, so the higher fat milk. Um, what I will say is that we do know um, that those unsaturated fats that I just mentioned, things like canola oil, olive oil, nuts and seeds are healthy for us. So they're good for us. And when we replace saturated fat with those healthy fats, it's actually heart protective. So it's good for us. Whereas those vegetarian sources, so the coconut oil or the dairy sources, like I just mentioned, um, they're not necessarily bad for us, but they're not good for us either. So at the end of the day, we like to focus on um, still replacing those saturated fats with those healthy fats. Um, but a little bit is okay. Trans fat, on the other hand, we really want to limit as much as possible. We know that trans fats are really not good for us. Um, they uh, are formed when fats are changed from liquid to a solid. 
and can be found in things like shortening, baked goods, cookies, crackers, potato chips, frozen french fries, and some margarine. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, we really want to uh, limit trans fats as much as possible, which hopefully um, in the near future we won't have to worry about because the food industry, knowing how bad they are for us, are, are trying to um, completely eliminate them. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is sodium. Um, so we know that too much sodium um, can uh, put us at risk for high blood pressure, stroke, heart disease. So when uh, we take in too much sodium and our blood pressure goes high, that's putting more work on our kidneys. So if we do have chronic kidney disease, we certainly want to limit our sodium or salt intake can also have detrimental effects on calcium and bone metabolism, which we also know um, is something that um, is important for individuals with chronic kidney disease. Uh, can also put you at increased risk of stomach cancer and severity, uh, so can make your symptoms of asthma if that is something that you do have worse. So the recommended amount um, is 1,200 to 2,300 milligrams per day. So that's quite a large range. And this is where you can talk to your doctor um, or your registered dietitian in the clinic to find out what would be the right amount of you for you. Um, as a healthy, if you're a healthy individual with no chronic disease, you know, between 1,800 and 2,000 milligrams per day is what we recommend. Um, and bear in mind that just one teaspoon of salt, so if you're cooking a recipe and I ask for one teaspoon of salt, you are adding in 2,300 milligrams of sodium. So that upper limit um, on that range there for that recommended allowance. Um, so, you know, we try and limit um, the amount of salt that we add to our cooking. So um, what I tell people is a little bit while you're cooking or preparing your recipe is okay, but maybe leave it off of the table. Adding more salt if you've added it to your cooking is not really necessary. Um, and I also like to let people know that salt is salt is salt. So whether it's sea salt, Himalayan salt, um, kosher salt, um, it's all salt and contains sodium. So no matter what you're using, you do want to limit um, the amount that you are using. Um, other things that you can do to limit your salt or sodium intake is read your labels, so choosing ones that have reduced or no salt added, um, comparing your nutrition facts, knowing that you want to aim for about less than 10% in a meal. So if you're, um, you know, using a microwaveable meal, um, you want to look for one that has as little salt or sodium as possible, so it's close to 10%, and less than 3% for a condiment. Focusing on fresh, so we know that our Fresh fruits and vegetables um, are unseasoned meats and chicken and fish, things like beans, so canned beans, you want to go with the low sodium versions and give them a good rinse, things like eggs, um, milk and grains are all naturally low in sodium. Um, where most of our salt comes from, it's not actually from the salt shaker, it's from those processed uh, foods like uh, frozen pizzas, frozen entrees, deli meat, sandwich meats, hot dogs, bologna, canned soups are another big culprit, um, in instant noodles, um, things like that. Um, more things that you can do is cooking at home. So once again, um, the more that we're cooking at home and not relying on those fast food, convenient foods like the canned soups, um, we're, we can cut down a lot of sodium that way. Try new seasonings um, and flavors. So using herbs and spices versus salt um, for your seasonings. The salt-free ones like Mrs. Dash or um, uh, the McCormick's Le Grill, um, no salt added are really good. Um, you want to avoid things like no salt and half salt, um, especially if you have chronic kidney disease because um, they replace it with potassium, so they can make your potassium go up. Um, and reducing things like condiments, soy sauce is a big one, and one tablespoon of mini soy sauce if you have upwards of 1,500 milligrams of sodium. Um, ketchup is another big one that also is a source of um, hidden sugars or added sugars. Things that are pickles and olives, um, we really want to try and limit those things because, once again, um, often pickled in salt. And it does take time for your uh, taste buds to adjust. 
So even though for the first few weeks things might taste a little bland um, or fresh, we like to say here in Newfoundland, um, it just does take a little time for your taste buds to adjust and, and they will adjust. So you just got to give yourself time and work on slowly but surely cutting down on your salt intake. And like I said, using some of those no salt added um, spices and herbs to really give your, your food flavor. So cholesterol, there's two types of cholesterol. There's our good cholesterol, which is our HDL, the high density lipoprotein. Um, and what they do is they carry the excess cholesterol back to the liver and it can get removed, which is exactly what we want. And then we have our bad cholesterol, the LDL, uh, low density lipoprotein. And they leave plaque um, deposits on the artery walls, which can cause blockages um, and re result in things like heart attack as well as can be damaging to our kidneys. So I like to say a good way to remember is our high density, our HDL, we want to be high and our low density uh, bad cholesterol, we want to be low. So what can we do to increase our good cholesterol, HDL? Uh, there's that, you know, you want to try and decrease smoking if you are doing it or avoid it. Exercise is one of the best ways to get your HDL um, up. The big thing though is you do want to get your heart pumping. So however you choose to exercise, whether it's walking, just make sure that you have a good brisk enough pace that you're getting your heart rate up a little bit. Um, if you are planning on starting to exercise and you haven't in a while, I always recommend talking to your doctor um, just to make sure that you have the okay. There's lots of options. Um, I know here we have the mall walkers. So even if you can walk only 10 feet, there's usually a bench um, that you can go and take a seat on. So slowly but surely increasing your activity is gonna be a great way to get that HDL up. Um, maintaining a healthy weight, weight, increasing those omega-3 fats. So those healthy fats that I was talking about earlier, um, omega-3 are found in things like fatty fish. So salmon, mackerel, herring. Um, found if you don't like fatty fish, some other options for you are things like ground flaxseed. Um, you just want to keep your ground flax in the fridge or freezer so it doesn't go bad. Things like chia seeds, walnuts, and soy foods. Um, so things like edamame, tofu are uh, good sources. Eating plenty of fruits and vegetables. Um, so making sure even if you're on a low potassium diet that um, you're getting your five to six serving of fruits and vegetables a day because it has so many other positive benefits. Um, and you can certainly talk to your dietitian about what those low potassium fruits and vegetables are. Avoiding those trans fats again and decreasing those added sugars. So trying to limit things like I was talking about earlier, the pop, the sweet, the candy, and then doing your label reading for those added sugars. Ways to decrease our LDL. So there's that eating more fruits and vegetables again. Increasing our soluble fiber. So um, there's actually two types of fiber. There's our insoluble, which is that roughage um, that we get from things like bran, uh, bran buds that helps keep us regular. And then there's that soluble fiber um, that we get in things like oatmeal and barley and our flaxseed and some of our fruits and vegetables like oranges, avocado, uh, beans, lentils, corn. Um, and soluble fiber does many positive things, but one of the biggest things it does do is help get rid of that cholesterol, and it also helps keep our sugar stable. Um, so very important if you're also diabetic to help those keep those sugars stable and help um, also keep your kidney safe, including plant sterols. Um, so you can get them naturally from fruits and vegetables. Um, but we also have some foods that are fortified, some margarines that are fortified, um, some yogurt. Um, and mentions juice there. We do try and limit our juice intake, um, especially like orange juice if you do have high potassium or you are a diabetic. We, um, but for everyone, we want to limit juice to um, less than half a cup a day because it's a, another form of that concentrated sugar. Um, increasing our monounsaturated fats. So once again, those fish and seafood, nuts and seeds, and our healthy oils like olive oil, canola oil, uh, flaxseed oil, sesame oil. Um, there's lots of good options. Avocado oil as well. Avocado oil is a really great um, just 
cooking oil, it's a very neutral, so it can be used at a high heat. Whereas our olive oil, um, a lot of people don't realize we we only want to lose on use on a low heat or raw. So in our salad dressing, or like I said, on a low heat, we don't want to fry or um, saute on a high heat in olive oil because it breaks it down into not such healthy fats or just not so good for us. Um, eating more plant protein, so things like beans and lentils, nuts and seeds and meat alternatives like tofu or, or soy. Um, so for, for those of you who do have chronic kidney disease and have maybe been told in the past that you do have high potassium or high phosphorus, um, you're seeing probably this message come up a, a lot about eating plant proteins like beans and lentils and they're coming up very often for as healthy foods. Um, it would be worth having this conversation with your dietitian in the clinic that you go to because what we do know is that when um, phosphorus is added to our food, so what's called phosphorus additives, which is often in our processed foods, um, so things that I mentioned earlier, um, like deli meats, um, frozen foods, um, sometimes in some of our canned foods, as well as in cola, so any of those colored uh, pops they often have what's called phosphorus additives. Um, and those get absorbed 100%. Whereas the phosphorus that's found in plant uh, foods, like plant proteins or beans or lentils, uh, nuts and seeds, they're only absorbed about 40 to 50%, as well as the same for goes for potassium. So in our um, processed food, potassium gets absorbed 100%, whereas our, with our fruits and vegetables, um, not as much. So um, it will be worth having a conversation with your dietitian to see perhaps if you can look at decreasing some of those um, processed foods and increase some of these healthy foods like our nuts and seeds, um, our whole grains that we know are so good for us um, and can keep us healthy um, if you have had a history of high potassium or high phosphorus. But as I mentioned, certainly talk to your dietitian in your clinic. Um, and if you do have chronic kidney disease, but potassium or phosphorus haven't been an issue yet, it's certainly very important to help continue to eat these foods um, because, like I said, they're so good for us, can actually help keep our, our kidneys as healthy as possible for as long as possible. Um, the last one there is decreasing our saturated fat in our commercial trans fat. So triglycerides. <clears throat> are fat made from your body and we want to keep our triglyceride levels um, very low um, and one of the best ways to do that is decreasing our sugar intake so our added sugars as I mentioned um, limiting alcohol um, increasing our healthy fats including things there again are those nuts and those soy products um, staying active and if you are diabetic, keeping your blood sugars under control. We know that um, when our blood sugars are um, chronically high, um, it can often lead to high triglycerides, which once again can build up in our arteries and um, put us at increased risk for heart disease and kidney disease. Um, so as I mentioned, decreasing our added sugar intakes and keeping our blood sugar under control um, as are some of the best ways to keep our triglycerides low. So snacking, <clears throat> um, I often get asked if snacking is healthy, and it certainly can be. Um, what I do recommend is when we're um, eating regularly, so what we want to do is aim to have three meals a day, four to six hours apart. If we're going longer than six hours, this is where a healthy snack can come into um, and be very helpful. So we're going longer than six hours, our blood sugar levels might start to drop a little bit. That's where we often um, get very hungry. And if we go into a meal starving, it's really hard to um, manage our portions. Um, as well as if, for example, we're driving home from work and you skip lunch that day, um, it's much more likely we might hit up that drive-through if we haven't eaten in a long time. So having a healthy snack um, can actually, like I said, be very helpful in helping you make those um, healthy choices. Um, the biggest thing, though, um, is listening to your body. So why you're wanting that snack. Um, eating at night, for example, 
grazing at night um, might not necessarily be the healthiest way to snack. Um, we want to just aim to keep it to one snack, um, you know, mid-morning or mid-afternoon or one snack in the evening. Um, and in that snack, you want to keep it um, to protein and fiber. So it's says complex carbs here. What we mean by that is something higher in fiber. So for example, apple and peanut butter, um, berries and yogurt, um, hummus and whole grain crackers, or cut up vegetable sticks. So uh, in a lot of cases, we often think of as a healthy snack as, you know, just a piece of fruit where we're getting that complex, that fiber, uh, but we're missing that protein part. And that protein part is what's going to help us stay full for longer. If you do have chronic kidney disease and you're trying to keep your protein levels under, um, you know, to moderate level, um, you can talk to your uh, dietitian and let her know that you are finding that you're hungry mid-afternoon or hungry in the evening and maybe look at ways of working together to um, incorporate a protein in your snack. Because like I mentioned, that um, having that protein and fiber is what is really important for keeping us full longer and keeping all of our energy levels stable and keeping us full and more satisfied for longer. So some tips when you're in the grocery store um, or for shopping, I should say. Um, you always want to go with a list. Um, when we have a list, it's a lot easier to stay on task. Um, planning out your menu for the week. Um, so looking at maybe when your flyers come out and sitting down and checking the flyers to see what deals are on and then planning a menu around that. Um, if you work during the week and you're busy, you find it difficult taking an hour on the weekend. If you are feeding a full family, having your family have a say. So if you have picky children or picky uh, significant others, having a full family, uh, full family meal and sit down, um, sorry, as I mentioned, and planning out um, your menu for the week. Don't go to the grocery store hungry. When we're hungry, uh, we're a lot likely to do that impulse buying. So grabbing that bag of chips or that chocolate bar, especially, um, if, like I said, if we've gone a long time without eating. Um, follow your diet guidelines. So if you do have a specific um, diet from your dietitian or from your doctor, you want to make sure that you're following those guidelines, taking those resources that you get from your dietitian and taking them into the grocery store with you, um, reading the labels for things like sodium, sugar, or those saturated and trans fats, um, and as well as looking through the ingredient list if you are looking for things like phosphorus additives. Um, Pre-plan your meal for the week. Um, so once again, by planning and checking the things like the flyers, looking for coupons, and you can build your uh, meal plan around that. Um, shopping the perimeter. So when we think of the perimeter of the grocery store, we think about our fruits and vegetables, our meats and our fish and our chicken, our bread, so our whole grains, our milk and our eggs are on the perimeter. Um, so you know, focusing on those areas first, but uh, keep in mind um, that they've done a really good job now of, of placing um, some highly processed food. So still making sure that you're reading your nutrition facts tables, um, especially, you know, for example, in the meat department, um, pre-season meat um, and chicken can often have higher salt, sugar, and phosphorus additives in them. Um, you know, a lot of these pre-made salads um, and things that are in the, the produce department, uh, once again, can have a lot of salt and sugar in them. So just because they're found in those departments, don't necessarily that they mean that they're healthy. You want to focus on the whole food. So the full fruits and vegetables, just our plain meats um, and things like that. And bear in mind that the center of our islet, it does have a lot of highly processed and prepared foods that are behind sodium and sugar and other things. Um, but it also contains things like our plain whole grain pasta, our whole grain rice or our rice, um, those healthy oils I've been talking a lot about, um, things like nuts and seeds and nut butter. So we do need to go down to the aisles once in a while um, to get some of those things, but it's just making sure that we have a list and we're trying to avoid those highly processed things like those prepared soups, canned chili, things like that, those deli meats. Um, so this is an example. Um, on the right-hand side there, 
Um, we have a peanut butter, so that would be a natural peanut butter. Um, and like I said, we, all we can see in the ingredient list is just roasted peanuts. So that's that peanut butter with the oil sits on top. You just want to give it a good stir and compare that to, say, the peanut butter here um, that has roasted peanuts, but then it also has corn syrup and sugar and um, hydrogenated uh, vegetables. So we're looking at trans fats there, um, along with many other things. So when we, even when we're going down into the aisles, trying to get the food in its most basic form, so things like natural peanut butter, natural almond butter, nut butters. So once again, um, not just looking at the nutrition facts table, but especially if we have, um, you know, elevated phosphorus levels um, and you're wondering also, again, where those added sugars are coming from, looking at the ingredient list as well um, is very important. So in this one, for example, what we have bolded there, corn syrup, sugar, um, corn syrup solids, dextrose, dextrose, high fructose corn syrup, fructose. So those are all different types of added sugars. So if you're wondering where the sugar is coming from, if you're looking on the nutrition facts table, look into the ingredient listing and it'll break it down for you. Um, and it can be very overwhelming. And as I mentioned there, for those who um, are, have elevated phosphorus, here we can see we have sodium acid acid pyrophosphate and monocalcium phosphate. So those are those phosphorus additives um, that get absorbed 100%. So we want to try and um, limit things that we see that have all this added sugar and phosphorus additives in them. Um, and how you can do that is by focusing on fresh um, or fresh frozen foods. Um, it, uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but especially in the winter mo months, our frozen foods can actually be just as health healthy, if not healthier, <clears throat> than our fresh. Um, if you walk around your produce department in the middle of March and just take a look at where a lot of your uh, fruits and vegetables are coming from, you know, you'll see places like Asia or Cambodia or Colombia or India. Um, so it's coming a really far distance. And the amount of time from the time that it's removed from its plant or from the root, um, it's losing its nutrition. So, you know, you're looking at somewhere anywhere between, you know, four, five, six weeks for it just to arrive and then uh, get, you know, onto the grocery shelves and then into your fridge. Um, whereas frozen fruits and vegetables, as long as there's nothing added to them, so just plain, um, they're flash frozen at their peak ripeness. Um, so that locks in all those nutrients. So if you're using them raw, so one of my favorites are frozen berries and using them in things like smoothies um, or adding it to yogurt um, is a great way to keep all those nutrients, um, making sure that you're absorbing all of them. Or um, just using frozen vegetables in things like soup. Um, so you're eating the broth that you're boiling them in um, or, you know, um, just in a stir fry. So just not overcooking them. Um, so like I mentioned, those winter months, especially frozen fruits and vegetables, can be just as healthy. Um, this time of year, or even just a few months ago, going to your local farmer's markets or to your local farms are great ways to know that you're getting the freshest um, or buying as local as possible. But like I said, in those winter months here in Canada, we're, we're pretty limited. Um, eating out can be very overwhelming. So talking to your dietitian. Um, checking out the menu online. Um, most restaurants um, and fast food places now have the nutrition facts on um, online, so you can go in and look, knowing your diet, so knowing the things to look out for. And it's certainly okay to enjoy a meal out with your family and friends, um, but just keeping, you know, moderation is key. So just because they're giving you four or five servings of pasta. You don't need to eat it all. You can certainly always take some home for lunch the next day. Um, so as I mentioned, looking at the menu ahead of time um, and looking to see if they have a nutrition fact. Um, communicating with your server um, and asking for no salt, um, no MSG, no cheese are ways to cut down on the sodium or saturated fat. Um, Asking for sauces and gravies on the side. So if you are getting a salad, ask for um, the sauce on the side so you can control how much is putting uh, you're putting on. Um, as delicious as that free bread is, sometimes if you're having 
a burger or a pasta, that's a lot of carbohydrate to take in. So skipping out on the free bread and letting your server know that you don't need it. Um, and still trying to aim for that plate model. So a quarter of a plate are protein, a quarter of a plate are starch, and a half a plate are vegetables. Um, you know, there are a lot of restaurants, for example, that will do half and half. So you can always ask your server, for example, if you, you know, you want to treat yourself and have those french fries, see if they'll do half a salad and half french fries or half steamed vegetables and half a baked potato. Uh, many restaurants are very accommodating. Um, so certainly asking and trying to follow um, this plate model as best as possible. Um, so some healthy choices or some choices for breakfast. So best choices would be things like eggs and omelets. Eggs are very good for us. Um, even though they do have cholesterol, we're not as concerned about um, dietary cholesterol, focusing on having lots of fiber and healthy fats. Um, high fiber unsweetened cereals. So when you're in the cereal aisle, we want to look for cereals that have more than four grams of fiber and less than eight grams of sugar because that sugar that's in that cereal is from added sugars. Um, so we want to keep that under eight grams or two teaspoons. Uh, French toast, whole grain toast um, versus things like pancakes or white bread. Um, and we want to get some protein there. So the eggs or whole grain toast with peanut butter. Um, half of a bagel or a small bagel or a small muffin, um, you know, not the Costco size muffins, um, as well as fruit over juice. Because as I mentioned, that juice is a concentrated form of sugar. So we're concentrating all that sugar um, into a drink and losing all the fiber with juice. So we, we prefer or recommend that you eat the fruit instead of drinking the juice. Um, so for appetizers, going for a salad or hummus and veggies. For entrees, we want to look for things that are grilled or baked. We want to avoid fried. Um, <clears throat> things like fajitas can be really good or tacos, soft shell tacos. Um, sandwiches, we want to look for real meat, um, not trying to avoid the deli meat. Um, or things like tuna and salmon or egg um, are much healthier choices than, say, a deli meat sandwich. Um, for side dishes, looking for the whole grain versions. Once again, having that conversation with your dietitian to see if that's a good choice for you. Um, brown rice, whole grain bread, um, and vegetables. Um, so for desserts, you certainly still need to enjoy yourself. Um, so share desserts. Um, you know, if you're out with your significant other or friends, try and share versus having the big dessert to yourself. Um, having things like yogurt and fruit, um, frozen fruit, um, or canned fruit in water um, are all good options. Um, and for beverages, sticking to things like water, coffee, tea, um, and avoiding, as you saw, the pop or the energy drinks. Sports drinks are another place that are often high in um, added sugars, also often have potassium and sodium added to them. Um, so not really necessary unless you're an athlete. Vitamin water is another one. Often have a lot of sugar added to it. So you want to be wary of those. Um, <clears throat> so once again, avoiding uh, processed meat limit, things like fish sauce, soy sauce, um, the teriyaki sauces. So a lot of those stir fry sauces. Um, if you're looking for options for stir fry, sesame oil um, can often give that that um, Asian flavor without all the salt and it's actually healthy fat. So um, using a little bit of sesame oil and then um, a bit of a lower sodium broth um, and going lighter on those really high sodium sauces. Um, using things like vinegar, um, and lemon um, juice, so an acid. So things like I said, vinegar, lemon, or lime juice can really help um, your flavor pop without having to add extra salt. Um, I got that tip from a chef that I work with. So if you're trying to cut back on the salt by even just squeezing a little bit of um, fresh lemon juice in there, you can really um, get those flavors um, stronger without having to use some of, some of those other things like soy sauce or, or um, salt. Avoid things that are seasoned, as I already mentioned. Um, 
and um, avoid package seasoning. So for example, if you're looking at um, making tacos or fajitas at home, a lot of those uh, pre-made seasoning packages also have a load of sodium in them. So, you know, using your own spice cupboard and adding chili powder and cumin um, and a little bit of salt um, is a much healthier way of going about it. <clears throat> So that's it from me. Do we have any questions? Thank you, Heidi. And yes, we do. We're now going to begin answering the questions submitted during the presentation as tonight. As a reminder, you can still submit your questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Heidi, our first question is, oh, there's many. Let me just grab one. <laughs> I, okay, first question is, I have type 2 diabetes. How yeah. important is carb counting? And do you have any t easy tips on how to do this? Um, that's a great question. Um, the best person to ask for that, where I don't know your specific situation, um, the best person to ask would be the dietitian in your diabetes education center or the dietitian that you're seeing. If we're on insulin, often enough they will try and recommend carbohydrate counting because it's the best way to manage your blood sugars. But without knowing the actual details, it's really hard for me to answer that. Um, so like I said, you can certainly email me after um, and I can try and provide a little bit more guidance um, with a little bit more detail. But like I said, the best person to ask will probably be the dietitian in your diabetes clinic there. And usually if you haven't been referred, um, most places, towns, communities do have a, di a diabetes clinic um, that you can go to and, and they can certainly answer that question for you. But um, it, it's kind of hard for me to answer that without having all the details. Thanks, Heidi, and thanks. I do see that yep. you've offered your email address, so thank you for that. Yep. Um, our next question, are there, are there ways to balance carbs and other foods to regulate the impact on my blood sugar, uh, period? I hear lots of talk about superfoods that will lower blood pressure, and is there any truth to this? <clears throat> um, there's not, a, yeah, the concept of superfoods has been around a long time. And if you've noticed over the years, there's a new superfood every year, you know, from kale to spinach to pomegranate. Um, at the end of the day, these are all healthy choices. So there's not one superfood. But um, if you noticed throughout the presentation, some themes of things that were coming up really often, nuts and seeds are very good for us, beans and lentils. So going for more of those vegetarian sources of protein, uh, like I mentioned, nuts seeds, beans, lentils, um, we know are really good for us. And for blood sugar control, they're higher in fiber, they're higher in protein, which is going to keep those blood sugars stable. Um, some of the best ways of keeping your blood sugar stable is trying to follow that plate method, as I mentioned, because um, we once again, vegetables are full of fiber, and that's going to slow down our digestion and slow down the release of our sugar, keeping them stable. So focusing on fiber, um, is probably one of the best ways of helping keep your blood sugar stable and there's not unfortunately one superfood um it's a variety of all of those healthy foods together thanks heidi and actually mm -hmm. just a little bit of a follow-up do you have any tips to help making diet changes stick um yeah so it's not trying to do, you know, a complete overhaul. So waking up on Monday morning and trying to do, for example, a, a big ketogenic diet, it's going to be taking small steps that fit into your lifestyle. So for example, if you're somebody who skips breakfast, breakfast is a great place that we can focus on getting in that fiber that I just mentioned. So trying to start small um, and even just uh, having a piece of fruit within an hour of getting up just to get yourself into the habit of having breakfast and then building on that. If you're finding that you are really, really hungry when you get home uh, from work or a long day, that you're um, overeating at your supper or eating a lot at night, maybe look at having that afternoon snack so that you're not so hungry, you're able to make those healthier choices. So another um, little step could be adding in an afternoon snack, making sure that it's fiber and protein. Um, little things like I'm going to aim to have vegetables at one meal a day. 
So they're all little behaviors, um, starting off small versus trying to overhaul everything and starting with small, simple changes. Thanks, Heidi. And just a reminder for our audience, if you do have any questions, please just type them into the question box. We still have time to answer a few more. And on that, Heidi, our next question is, you mentioned to restrict juice. Now, is this just yeah. processed juice or is juice that you make at home better? Um, <clears throat> that's a great question. Um, so there are different types of juicers that are out there. Um, I always recommend trying to eat the food, um, the food whole because there's a lot more satisfaction that comes in, comes from that. That being said, there are juicers that are out there that actually mulch up the, uh, the whole fruit and the whole vegetable. So you're getting everything. My concern, um, that comes with juicing at home or with a lot of the juicers, you probably notice all you're losing all of that fiber. And when we're losing that fiber, um, as I mentioned, how important fiber is, um, you're, you're losing all of it. So, and you're just getting that concentrated sugar. So um, there are different types of juicers, like I mentioned, that actually mulch up the fruits and vegetables so that you're retaining that fiber. Um, but in a lot of cases, when you're con concentrating, you know, a whole salad into one little glass, there's a lot less satisfaction that comes with that than actually taking the time to eat and enjoy your food. Um, now, if you have a de decreased appetite, there are some different things um, where that can help, but that will be talking to your dietitian or your doctor about that specific case. But if you're just a healthy individual trying to get more nutrients into your body, I'm always of the mindset of, of eating food whole. Um, but if you are looking at juicing, maybe spending a little bit of extra money to get the one that, that you're retaining all that fiber versus just throwing it all out. Thanks, Heidi. This question is about alcohol. And I know you said to mm -hmm. limit alcohol, but I'll be tempted over yep. the holidays. So would you yep. advise a beer or wine or hard liquor as the best choice or <laughs> brackets at the least bad choice? <laughs> um, that's a great question. And once again, it's kind of hard for me to answer without having more information. Um, the biggest thing is just going to be trying to limit to that kind of two two drinks. I understand it's all about moderation. You certainly need to enjoy that once in a while. We know that um, certain types of red wine have more antioxidants that are okay for us. Um, but if you're a diabetic, that might not be the best choice. And a lower carbohydrate beer might be a better choice. Um, or, you know, one ounce of a hard liquor mixed with water or a diet clear uh, soda. Um, so it's kind of hard for me to answer that, but the biggest thing is just enjoying it in moderation and trying to keep it to, you know, those two drinks, uh, no more than those two drinks a day. And that doesn't mean saving them all up for one night, unfortunately. Um, it's, you know, keeping it to that one to two drinks max a day. Um, but ultimately it really depends if you are a diabetic, perhaps lower carbohydrate beer, um, might be a better option if you're not, um, and you're just looking to enjoy a drink, um, a glass of, wine or two would be okay as well. Thanks, Heidi. And I think this might be our last question, but we do have time if people have it. Um, can you explain what plant sterols are in a little more detail? And I just... Yeah, so plant sterols actually, um, they're found naturally. I'm just gonna go to that slide, just one moment. They're found naturally in our fruits and vegetables, and as I mentioned, added uh, to some of our foods. But what plant sterols do is they have a similar structure um, to cholesterol. So it will replace kind of that cholesterol in your body, which helps lower your bad cholesterol, that LDL, without affecting um, your HDL, the good cholesterol, by partly blocking cholesterol absorption. So you're not then able, when you're, um, having those plant sterols, your body's not actually able to absorb the cholesterol that might be found in the food, the dietary cholesterol. Um, so you're getting rid of that um, and replacing it with the plant sterols. So that's how it can help reduce um, that um, bad cholesterol. 
Excellent. Thanks, Heidi. And I think I'm just going to let me review. I think that was the last question. And so I'm just going to check the question box one more time. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Heidi. That was such a great presentation. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Trina Ralph, the Executive Director at the Kidney Foundation of Canada, Atlantic Branch, to say a few words. Trina? And Trina, just a reminder to come off mute. I think you still may be muted, Trina. Um, just look at the bottom of your toolbar. I have it now. I didn't. I, I'm, <laughs> and this is where, Tracy, I'm happy to have you uh, because I didn't realize by muting my computer screen, I was also muting my phone. Well, thank you, so Trina. Thank you. We can hear you now. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, as Tracy said, I'm the Executive Director of the Kidney Foundation Atlantic Branch. This presentation was made possible through the sponsorship of uh, the TELUS Atlantic uh, Canada Community Board. So I want to off offer a special appreciation to them. Uh, we've also been uh, lucky enough uh, through this TELUS funding to offer face-to-face -face and live sessions as well. And we're hoping we'll be able to continue to do that in 2019. I also want to say a thank you to Heidi for presenting today. Uh, Heidi, your time uh, was really appreciated. Uh, to Tracy uh, for helping me organize uh, the technical side of this. I wouldn't have been able to uh, work with my team and ensure this was delivered to the people attending tonight without you. I want to make a special mention to one of the attendees tonight. It's Pam Dill. Uh, Pam is a dietitian uh, in Nova Scotia and has no idea I'm calling her out right now. Uh, but Pam was instrumental in helping us develop this program and get the funding. So a big thank you to Pam uh, who provided the, I guess, uh, um, an overview of how this would look to keep it congruent throughout Atlantic Canada, but allow dietitians to adapt and change it to regional needs. Uh, so thank you, Pam, for helping us create this and secure the funding and the partnership with TELUS by the program development you've done. Uh, I want to remind everybody that these slides, I am going to send them out in the next couple of days uh, by PDF. And also, if you want information in particular on kidney health, uh, the Kidney Foundation of Canada has a resource called Kidney Community Kitchen, and you will find it at kidneycommunitykitchen.ca. We're also going to be sending out a survey uh, over the next day, and I do hope you will take the time to fill that out so we are able to improve this program uh, as we move in our future directions. I want to thank everyone tonight for attending. I hope you found it beneficial, and we look forward to you attending more educational webinars and program webinars from the Atlantic Branch. Thank you, Trina, and thank you, Heidi, and for everyone for attending tonight's webinar, What's on Your Plate. And as Trina said, once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You'll also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. And on behalf of the Kitty Foundation in Canada and our presenter, thanks for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day.